Christian, thank you for coming out on this beautiful day to hear um, Andrew Gumbel talk about his new book, uh, which is a very impressive piece of work. Andrew is a Los Angeles-based journalist and writer, longtime foreign correspondent for The Guardian and The Independent, covered the collapse of communism, the wars in Yugoslavia, the rise of Silvio Berlusconi, and not the fall, though, I guess, yet, um, <laughs> mostly for The Independent of London. Uh, he came to the United States in 1998. He's written extensively about politics, the criminal justice system, pop, pop culture. His work has appeared in The Los Angeles Times, The Atlantic, Mother Jones, Vanity Fair, He's the author of uh, another book, Steal This Vote, Dirty Elections and the Rotten History of Democracy in America. And um, this is his second book, and he's about to produce a third book. So Andrew, uh, leave the floor is yours. OK, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I will talk for a little while, and then hopefully we can get some kind of discussion going. Um, I just wanted to start by plunging you into the middle of everything. I don't know, I'm sure all of you remember the Oklahoma City bombing, how Timothy McVeigh was arrested. Two days later, he was stopped by a highway patrolman who's, who saw that he was missing his rear license plate as he was leaving Oklahoma. And you know, the official story, as it was told, was the culprits were identified very quickly. They were arrested. A case was put against them. They were tried. They were punished. Case closed. The FBI did a wonderful job. Um, and I wouldn't be sitting here if, if I agreed with that assessment. And things really were much more complicated, and a lot of things went very wrong for reasons I want to explain. And maybe the best place to start is on the day that McVeigh was brought into federal custody, which was two days later, April the 21st, 1995. The FBI was immensely active, had been for 48 hours. They were drafting people in from all over the country, adding manpower in many states, Oklahoma itself, in Kansas, in Arizona, in many other parts of the country, in Michigan. And on the 21st, over and above McVeigh, they were, had a tremendous interest in the Nichols brothers. Terry, who was in Kansas, and his brother James, who was on the family farm in Decca, Michigan, which is in the Thumb, maybe 90 minutes north of Detroit. The FBI, with a number of other agencies, including the ATF, local law enforcement, were gathering what was effectively a SWAT team around the James Nichols farm, ready for the right moment to pounce, ready for enough, waiting also for enough evidence to gather so they could have probable cause to go in. In Kansas, you had one FBI agent who was looking for Terry Nichols' house. He had the wrong address, as it turned out, because um, Terry's ex-wife muddled up the numbers. So he was driving around frantically trying to find it. There was a special operations group from the FBI coming in from Kansas City. A helicopter was whirring overhead. And the mindset was this. It was, OK, we know that these two people are of great interest in the investigation, but we don't know how far this thing goes. We don't know if they have other bombs that they're ready to detonate in other cities. We don't know if this guy McVeigh, who we've picked up, is a driver, if he's the mastermind, if he's somewhere in between. So we have got all our options open. We want to keep an eye on these people. We want to keep a low profile. We want to follow them. We want to bug their phones. We want to do whatever it takes to see if we can establish if there's a broader network. And then everything comes to a grinding, crashing halt because within the investigation, there's a media leak. James and Terry Nichols' names are out on the radio saying that the feds are after them. And that is really the end of that. James jumps in his car, goes on an improvised shopping trip, basically to just to get out of the farm so that he doesn't die in what he imagines will be a showdown with the FBI. Terry, very similarly, panics, goes home, picks up his wife and his infant daughter, and they go to the police station in Harrington, Kansas, where he volunteers to talk about everything he knows, thinking he can bluff his way through, and in the meantime, try and find out what it is exactly that the feds might know about him. Um, the point being about this moment <coughs> that all possibility of, keep, you know, of finding out who else might have been involved essentially crashed and burned. And it was really bad luck. Um, and it was a function of how high profile the media in interest was. It was a function of how huge the investigation was. And we don't know exactly who leaked the news about Terry and James Nichols. But one thing we do know is that the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, was taking everything from every briefing that was occurring within the investigation in Oklahoma City and putting it out to every single one of its offices, completely unadulterated. So you had hundreds of possible leak sources within the ATF, just to name one agency. Uh, there was also a, a particular problem that one of the ATF agents from Texas was sleeping with a reporter from the Dallas Morning News and telling her absolutely everything he knew. So the Dallas Morning News for about three weeks had the most spectacular series of scoops about the investigation. None of this was helpful to figuring out what had actually happened. 
Um, but what I argue in the book is it wasn't just a matter of bad luck that prevented the investigation from finding other co-conspirators and or other people who might have inspired the plot, who might have taught McVeigh and Nichols how to build a bomb because they certainly didn't know by themselves, and on and on and on. There were also a number of really big systemic problems to do with how the federal government had been tracking the radical far right and also how they interacted with each other. And it was really, you know, looking back on it now with the benefit of the full documentary record, which was the basis for writing the book, which wasn't previously available, one understands that it was really very similar to the run-up to 9-11 in that you had a situation where the few qualified agents who knew what was going on, who knew how grave the risk was, were screaming from the rooftops but were not being heard. You had a problem that the ATF and the FBI both had key pieces of information that they weren't sharing with each other. They weren't, in many cases, doing what was necessary based on that information within their own agencies. And so you had a situation where everybody chose to block their ears and close their eyes and hope for the best, and the next thing you know, a bomb goes off in Oklahoma City. Um, the things that got missed, most particularly, um, were the things that the FBI could have done, the ATF could have done based on what they had failed to do before, but human nature being what it is and institutional cowardice being what it is, they chose not to. There were a large number of people we now know from the documentary record who came forward and showed that a number of people had foreknowledge of the bombing. None of those people were ever questioned by the FBI. There was, for example, a man on death row who was executed on the very same day as the bombing um, by the name of Wayne Snell, who happened to have plotted in 1983 to blow up the same building, the Murrah Building in Oklahoma City. Um, he talked to his prison guards in very vivid terms about how his friends were going to take revenge for his death. On the night before the bombing, he was up all night watching the TV, and then when the news came through of the bombing, he started celebrating like crazy in his cell. He wasn't obviously available to interview because he was executed 12 hours after the bombing, but his wife, who visited him regularly, was in close touch with the militia movement and some of the fringe elements that, in the same circles that McVeigh moved in. She was never properly questioned. There was one perfunctory interview. That was it. Uh, the people who Mary Snell, his wife, had been talking to, including Lewis, Lewis Beam, who was the biggest propagandist for the radical far right. He'd openly declared war on the government. Um, he was never questioned. And on and on and on. And it's not that these people were necessarily directly involved in the plot, we don't know, because that investigation never happened. But they were obvious people to go and talk to, to press, to see who, you know, what they might have known. Beam, for example, had been in Waco at the siege at exactly the same time as Timothy McVeigh in the spring of 1993. Had they met? We don't know. They were there at exactly the same time. McVeigh knew exactly who he was. Beam had, prop had developed this theory of how to fight a guerrilla war called leaderless resistance, and McVeigh was a student of that, and what he did was essentially a perfect exemplar of that. So there are lots of reasons to think they certainly had a lot in common, and yet Mc, um, Beam was not touched. The other place which was left almost completely alone is a radical community in eastern Oklahoma by the name of Elohim City which, as it was run, was purportedly a pacifist community with people who had rather cookie ideas about how to live their lives. They homeschooled their children. They had their own money system. They had their own sense of time. They measured time according to the solar clock, and every day began at noon and ended at noon instead of midnight to midnight, and on and on. But in this community, there were a large number of people who either passed through or lived there who were radical criminals. They were members of a very violent revolutionary bank robbery uh, gang who were extremely successful. They robbed 22 banks over a two-year period. They talked about financing a revolution to overthrow the government. None of them was ever questioned about the Oklahoma City bombing. They were pursued for the bank robberies, but nothing else. There were other violent criminals at Elohim City. Likewise, they were never questioned. And I think the explanation for this is twofold. Number one, the federal government and the federal agencies didn't want to dwell on their own past mistakes. The fact that they had been tracking or should have been tracking these people and failed to do what was necessary to find out what might have been in the works. And in particular, the ATF had an undercover informant at Elohim City who was pulled out just a few weeks before the bombing, not because she wasn't good at what she did, but rather the opposite. She was giving the ATF such disturbing information, they understood that if they were going to keep her there, they were going to have to do something about it. 
And the last thing the ATF wanted was to get into a confrontation like they had at Waco, like they had at Ruby Ridge, and screw it up again, because Congress was after them. The Republican majority wanted the agency closed down, essentially. And so the head of the ATF, he told me this quite openly and frankly, made a decision that he was going to close down the informant operation and just hope that nothing bad was going to happen. And he admitted to me 15 years later, he said, you know what? If she'd stayed there, we probably would have found out about the bombing and we would have probably stopped it. So there was a big institutional imperative not to dwell on those mistakes. And then going forward with the prosecution of McVeigh and Nichols, the imperative then became, we need to get these people convicted, we need to push for the maximum sentence, and nothing needs to get in the way of that goal. And it became very tempting for the prosecution to say, you know what, if there are indications of other people, if there's the possibility of delving into the radical far right with who knows what results, the problem is that we may just give ammunition to the defense at trial without actually establishing any more facts about who was responsible for this terrible act. And so piece by piece by piece, every one of those lines of investigation was closed down. Sometimes the FBI closed it down itself. Sometimes the prosecutor said, you know what, we're not interested in this, let's let it drop. Uh, one famous example that was in the news at the time was the so-called John Doe 2 figure. There were two people who were reported to have rented the rider truck that was used to carry the bomb. The first one was assumed to be McVeigh, and in fact one of the interesting things about the case is the government never really proved that it was McVeigh for a number of reasons we can go into afterwards. But the second person was an absolute mystery. There was a huge manhunt for him. Leads came cascading down on the FBI. They couldn't deal with any of them, all the people they were told about turned out to be not connected to the crime. And after about a month, they came up with a theory of misassociation based on other people who'd come into the same rental agency to rent a truck and said, you know what, the employees there got muddled up between two different days and John Doe 2 effectively does not exist. And one of my contacts in the FBI who was in Washington, who was monitoring the investigation from there, turned to one of his colleagues and said, is the problem that he doesn't exist or that you just couldn't find him? Which I think is the really apposite question here. So John Doe 2 was made to disappear. And again, piece by piece by piece, all these other things were made to disappear. In the run up to trial, the Justice Department, one or two prosecutors in particular, together with one or two FBI agents, went to all the key witnesses and really sort of drilled down on them to try and get them to change their testimony if they had testimony that was not in line with the prosecution theory. And in some cases, get them to admit that an identification they had made earlier was mistaken and they must have been talking about someone else. This is actually permitted under the federal rules of evidence. It's, it's allowed in federal court to coach witnesses effectively. You know, the theory is you're talking them th walking them through their evidence to make sure they're absolutely sure and clear about what they know versus what they don't know. But in practice, as many of the defense lawyers in the case told me, this you know, looks like coaching, if not even coercion, when it's really pushed to its extreme. So you, you came to trial um, with a sort of a truncated case. Um, and even then, the case against McVeigh was rather circumstantial. There were a lot of things that the government couldn't really say for sure. They didn't know how he learned how to build the bomb. They didn't know for sure that he was the one who rented the truck. When it came to the morning of the bombing, plenty of people had seen McVeigh in Oklahoma City, but every single person who saw him, and there were about two dozen eyewitnesses, all saw him with someone else, and in some cases with other vehicles. There was a whole panoply of information out there, none of which was ever followed up, again, because the government couldn't figure out where it might lead, and they were afraid of going down that path. And the case that was put on in federal court against McVeigh in particular was very much based on emotion. They showed images of the destruction. They made sure that every few days, after a lot of technical evidence, they'd bring one of the bereaved relatives of the victims in to talk about losing a child in the daycare center or losing family members who were working for the federal government, and made sure that the jury was really on the brink of tears all the way through, and associated that emotion with McVeigh. And that was really what got him convicted and got him the death penalty. Um, that and some less than stellar lawyering on, on the other side. Um, and I think partly because it was the 1990s and not the modern era with blogs, with the internet, and so on, the government managed to keep a pretty good lid on all of this information. There were a whole lot of conspiracy theories out there, people seeing things that didn't make sense and guessing as to what they might mean. But because the case files, for the most part, remained you know, closed, the defense lawyers got most of them. They had to fight for a lot of them, especially anything to do with other people. Um, but a lot of that information did not come out until, until Roger Charles, my co-author, and I managed to get access to it a couple of years ago. And because um, you know, nobody in the government really wanted to admit 
all the things that had gone wrong, what the internal discussions were within the prosecution team. Obviously, there was no interest in talking about that at the time. Now we know a lot more. Um, as I say, a, a lid was kept on the whole thing, and, and a conventional wisdom grew up that this was really basically a success by the federal government to manage to confront this terrible act and bring the prosecution of it to a successful conclusion. And I think it did the country a great disservice that this truncated version became received wisdom. I think it did the country a disservice in the run-up to 9-11 because there'd been no opportunity to absorb the lessons of Oklahoma City because they hadn't even been articulated. And I think going forward now, um, there remains a lot of open questions. You know, clearly a lot of things have changed since 9-11. Some of the things that made the FBI leery of conducting intelligence-based operations, which were actually banned in, in the 1990s, um, this was a hangover from the Watergate era, if something wasn't directly related to criminal prosecution, the FBI wasn't allowed to do it. The domestic terrorism wing of, of the FBI basically had almost no cases because they were terrified of going down that road at all. That's obviously changed completely. Um, the other thing that's changed, for what it's worth, is it's now much harder to buy 50-pound bags of ammonium nitrate without a lot of questions being asked. But a lot of things have not changed. Access to deadly weaponry is still pretty easy. Um, you have a situation where the federal law enforcement agencies are still very mistrustful of each other. The FBI and the ATF don't like each other one bit. Um, and you also socially and politically have a situation not dissimilar to the situation that McVeigh found himself in, except compounded many times, that you have people who've gone off to war in the US military. They've seen you know, combat. Many of them come back traumatized. They come back to a terrible economy, very high unemployment. And you know, whereas of the vast majority of them will find their way, muddle through, there will be a fringe who may well be attracted to radical ideologies who have the knowledge and the skill to think about becoming a warrior to fight against the system. You also have a tremendous wave of anti-establishment feeling in this country at the moment, again, most of which is entirely legitimate, whether it's the Tea Party on the right, Occupy on the left, or other movements. But on the fringes, you have people who are radicalized by the fact that there's the first black president in the White House. Um, and you see, in fact, the Southern Poverty Law Center has tracked this. That there's a surge in the number of hate groups unparalleled really since the early to mid 90s at the time when McVeigh was coming out of the army. Um, there was the anti-establishment wave of Newt Gingrich's contract with America and the Republican majority that came into Congress in 1994. The anger against gun control that existed then, which again, you're seeing echoes of that and, and, and hints of that with the whole controversy over Trayvon Martin and the Stand Your Ground laws and all the rest of it. So there are sort of unnerving parallels, and I think there's a sense that something like this could happen again. Um, and it's, not, it's an open question. I wouldn't pretend to know the answer, whether the federal law enforcement agencies are better prepared now to face the risk than they were then. One thing I do know for a fact from talking to people who were the leading experts and the most experienced people in tracking the radical far right in the 80s and 90s, this is that a lot of them have either now retired or have been transferred to other duties. After 9-11, a lot of them were, were, were switched to international terrorism to, to track radical Islamists, and they were no longer looking at the domestic threat. So I think it is an open question whether or not this threat is being adequately monitored now. I will stop there for the moment. Um, there's plenty more to talk about. Um, Peter, I think, wanted to ask one or two questions, and then I would love it if we could, we could get into a conversation. So the book is Oklahoma you. City, What the Investigation Missed and Why It Still Matters. What do you think, what is the, you know, if you had perfect knowledge of, of what the event that happened, uh, what was McVeigh's role in it, and who were the other conspirators, to the extent you can... The, you know, a lot of that is guesswork, is yeah. the first thing to say. Um, and one of the things I was very careful of when writing this book is I didn't want to be accused of being another conspiracy theorist. In fact, mm -hmm. in the preface, I talk quite extensively about how that phrase was used and misused by everyone, including the government, who every time they were criticized legitimately would dismiss their critics as conspiracy theorists. I wanted to make it as hard for members of the government or former members of the government who I criticize in this book to come back with that line. So let me say, first of all, this is guesswork. But it's, some of it is inspired guesswork or informed guesswork. I think it's you know, my reconstruction of what happened that morning based on talking to people who are involved in the investigation, people who are on the ground. For example, the head of the Federal Protective Service who was directly responsible for safety at the federal building and the federal complex, because right next door to the federal building in Oklahoma City is the federal courthouse. 
Right next to that, across an alley, is the old post office building, which is also full of legal offices and, and, and federal courthouses. Um, my reconstruction is this, is that McVeigh was almost certainly with some other people. We don't know how many, but probably not that many, because the whole principle was leaderless resistance. You don't have any more people in on the plot than you absolutely need. But it seems there was more than one vehicle, um, and that the original plan was to drive the truck into the underground garage beneath the federal courthouse and blow that up and kill a lot of federal judges. They made a very, very elementary mistake, and I heard about this through my contacts in the radical far right, but also in law enforcement, that they forgot to measure the height of the truck and it didn't fit into the garage. So at 8.30 in the morning, they'd try and drive the thing in. Holy crap, we can't fit the thing in. What do we do now? The next thing that it appears they tried to do was to fit into the alley between the federal courthouse and the old post office building, which was where the private garage where the federal judges came in. Only they could use that garage. And that plan was thwarted because there was a federal marshal's truck that was transporting a prisoner to court that morning that was sitting in that alley. And according to Tom Hunt, who was the head of Federal Protective Service, who knew the marshal, according to the marshal and according to one or two others, the rider truck went into the alley, saw the marshal's truck, reversed, came back out again. They were seen in various locations around downtown Oklahoma City trying to figure out what to do. And then it seems this, there was an improvised last minute decision to park the car in the handicapped, handicapped spot on the north side of the Murrah building directly beneath the daycare center where a lot of federal workers had their children go to school, to, 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 to preschool. Um, and it further appears that this was McVeigh's idea. And how do we know this? We know this because in December 1994, McVeigh and his friend Michael Fortier visited Oklahoma City McVeigh was seen by the woman who ran the daycare center and her husband, who happens to be Tom Hunt, the head of the Federal Protective Service. He went up to the daycare center, started asking a lot of really weird questions. He said he was a military recruiter moving from Wichita. He had two children, didn't want to give their names now, didn't want to give his wife's name, didn't want to give his own name. He didn't have a name badge. And all he was asking about was security for the daycare center. That was his only interest. And Danielle Hunt, who was the woman who ran it, thought this was the weirdest thing ever. Her husband, when he came in with his uniform, spooked McVeigh completely, who then left by another entrance so that he wouldn't have to run into him again. Uh, four months later, the Hunts look at each other when they see the news on the TV and said, that's the guy who came into our office. So it seems that it was, that was McVeigh's idea. The next thing that I figured out is that um, the car, which was missing the rear license plate, probably wasn't intended as a getaway car in the sense that it was actually used. It was meant as what in bank robbery parlance is known as a drop car. It was supposed to be a car that would just get him to the city limits and then he would switch cars and drive off in another one. Somehow that plan went wrong and we don't know why, whether it was because his co-conspirators saw that he'd blown up the, the, the federal building instead of the federal courthouse and were appalled at that decision and just melted away as fast as they could and left him on his own or for some other reason, we just don't know. That is the realm of speculation. But I'm pretty convinced that the reason he was driving that car towards the Kansas border rather than another vehicle that actually worked properly because this car was on the verge of breaking down as well as not having a rear license plate and on and on and on. Um, I don't think he ever intended to be driving that car out of town. And that was where the plot started unraveling. And once he was caught, he decided that he was going to take sole credit to protect the identity of the others and really, his, you know, his reviews on the radical far right after the attack were terrible. Everybody said, you know, what was he thinking? You know, we should have been attacking the FBI. We should have been attacking the ATF. We shouldn't have been attacking social security workers and ordinary people going to social security offices, going to HUD offices. We should absolutely not have been attacking toddlers and preschoolers. Um, you know, this is the worst thing that he could have possibly done. It's killed the revolutionary movement stone dead, which in fact turned out to be the case. Um, so. But he did, McVeigh did have credit in the movement for one thing, and that was for not, not talking about other people. He kept quiet all the way through to his execution. In fact, he hastened his own execution, and I can go into that if you want, to make sure that he would be executed in, in record time. Um, and the extraordinary thing is McVeigh wanted to take sole credit for the crime. The federal government that was worried about news getting out that there may have been others that they'd missed were thrilled that he was willing to take sole credit. They stuck with that storyline too. And so their interests converged and, and, and those storylines became the received wisdom. And you know, I firmly believe that's, that's, that's a very oversimplistic version of it. You mentioned that you had access to documents that people hadn't had previously or 
what, what, what are those documents and how did you come about them? A lot of it is just the dense detail of the FBI investigation. So they interviewed 18,000 witnesses over a two, three year period. Some of those had come out previously, a lot of them hadn't. Was um, it a FOIA thing or how did you get access no, to it? No, uh, the way we got access to it is that Terry Nichols gave permission for those documents to be released and his last trial lawyer who represented him in state court in Oklahoma very reluctantly abided by his wishes and handed them over. Um, so there were also FOIA documents that came to light. There were other things that came to light in, in more roundabout ways, um, some really spectacular documents which show how the federal government was not, you know, the different arms of the federal government not talking to each other. One spectacular document we got were the field notes of a, social, of, of a secret service agent who was responsible for tracking the phone records in the first few days of the investigation. She did an unbelievable job in putting the whole thing together in almost no time. She was then airbrushed out of the story completely. The FBI accused her of breaking protocol, of obtaining things without proper subpoenas, of jeopardizing the admissibility of the phone records completely. They pretended she didn't exist. They redid her investigation from scratch. And this document, her field notes, it was as though it never existed. The trial judge never saw it. The prosecution never saw it. The defense certainly never saw it. And when I showed it to the head of the FBI investigation of the, uh, of the bombing, and he read it, he said, I don't want Judge Mage, the trial judge, to know that this thing exists because if it is, he's going to come after heads and the first head he's going to come after is mine. He was absolutely alarmed that this document had never come to light. So you can see the way in which there were these the extraordinary intrigues within the investigation, information being withheld, people's roles being suppressed, agencies trying to grab credit from each other. It was a real mess. You, your co-author, what's his background? And, and writing a book solo is difficult, but writing it with another person must be another layer of difficulty. So how was that? Um, what Roger Charles provided was access to the documents and access to Terry Nichols. Terry Nichols, um, because of the Patriot Act, is not allowed to speak to the media. And I don't want to go into details, but Roger figured out a way to talk to him anyway. Um, and because he got to talk to him, we managed to get the discovery documents through Terry Nichols, and that was you know, an invaluable contribution to this project. Is Nichols under special administrative measures, that's so-called? Why isn't he allowed to talk to the media? Um, because he is a terrorist um, under the Patriot Act. I, I, you know, I, I hesitate to give chapter and verse because I don't right. remember chapter and right. verse, but my understanding is that the federal government now has the ability to deny media access to anyone invoking the Patriot Act, and particularly people who are convicted of terrorism and terrorist-related activities. Where is he now? He's in the Supermax in Colorado, and he's been there since the beginning. What do you think the influence of uh, the Turner Diaries was on McVeigh in this plot? Let me explain quickly what the Turner Diaries is. Um, it is a book that was written under a pseudonym by William Pierce, who was the head of the National Alliance, which was basically the leading neo-Nazi organization in the United States. And it's a pretty startling read. It's basically about a group of revolutionaries who respond to an attempted government crackdown on, on guns, on personal possession of guns. And in response, the first thing they do is they blow up FBI headquarters in Washington with a truck bomb which is driven into the underground garage. If you un can hear a few echoes already, it's probably not a coincidence. Um, and they don't stop there, and by the end of the book, they've dropped a nuke on Washington, D.C., which um, might seem slight overkill in response to a gun control law, but it's, it's, it's an astonishing book. It's, you know, for ordinary readers, I think it's impossible to get through without wanting to take several cold showers along the way, but it was a bestseller on the gun show circuit and really popular with a lot of people who were drawn to this extremist ideology. And I think it's a heavily racist book as well, but I think the appeal of it was actually less the racism than it was the radical anti-government revolutionary spirit, this idea that we need to band together, take arms against a corrupt government, and you know, if need be, destroy the world in order to prove that we are pure and correct and are the real heirs of the founding fathers of the American Constitution. Um, McVeigh read it when he was in the army. He always had it with him when he went around on the gun show circuit selling his rather paltry wares at, at gun shows. He pressed it on anybody who he could possibly find to press it on. And you, know, you can see in the conception of the plot a number of echoes. William Pierce also wrote a second book called Hunter. Um, and that is about somebody who goes around shooting interracial couples who then gets recruited by a shady 
government recruiter who then gets him to do a number of things, including blowing up a Mossad office in Virginia with an ammonium nitrate bomb. And there's a very detailed description of how that bomb is put together. And again, you can see a lot of ways in which what McVeigh ended up doing with however many people he ended up doing it with was inspired by these books. And I think, you know, if you look at his letters, if you look at the way that he talked to his friends, it becomes clear that he lived in a bit of a fantasy world of the Turner Diaries. And in September 1994, when the government passed the assault weapons ban, um, he saw that as the Turner Diaries coming to life. Terry Nichols told us that. He said that was an absolutely key moment for McVeigh. And that was not coincidentally the moment when they started assembling bomb components and started thinking about their revolution. One interesting question is why would they assemble bomb components in September and October of 94 if the bomb is only going to go off in April 1995? To which, according to Terry Nichols, and I actually believe him on this, I think the plan was to blow up something like the Federal Building in Oklahoma City much sooner and to aim for something really big for April 19th. Probably the FBI headquarters is what they would have loved to have done. Um, why didn't they blow up anything or attempt to blow up anything sooner than April? Mainly because Terry Nichols got spooked and left the country. McVeigh then tried to recruit Michael Fortier, who was another army buddy of his who lived in Arizona. He also got spooked, said no. He came with him on that trip to, to Oklahoma City where they, where they checked out the federal building. McVeigh visited the daycare center, but then he said, ooh, I'm not having anything more to do with that. So McVeigh was left high and dry with no one to carry out the plot with. When Terry Nichols came back from the Philippines, which is where he went, then McVeigh got back in touch with him and things moved towards April the 19th. But I believe the plan was to start earlier and build up to a crescendo to some grand finale on 19, April 19th, which in McVeigh's head, even if it wasn't practically a, a, anything they could have ever pulled off, the idea was to blow up the, the FBI, just like in the Turner Diaries. Great. Well, let's open it to the audience if you have a question just identify yourself and wait for the mic I'm Matt Bennett third way um, this is all fascinating the Secret Service agent notes that you read did you f were there things in there that were exculpatory is that why the uh, FBI agent was so worried that this would uh, come to the attention of the judge or what, what was it about those notes that made them so interesting? Um, this is, it's a very good question, and I grappled with it, and, and the, the lawyer for, for William Morrow grappled with it too, because we had to try and figure out you know, how much was an argument of convenience by the FBI because they wanted to take credit for this, how much of it was a turf war between, between the Secret Service and, and the FBI, and how much of it was you know, real grounds for concern that the agent whose name was Mary Riley had, had made some kind of mistake. I can tell you that she was actually investigated internally by the Secret mm -hmm. Service for having violated various things in terms of seeking subpoenas, getting information through the proper channels, observing the correct protocol. She was actually cleared in that investigation, but as soon as it was over, she left the Secret Service she got a very high profile job with the Bank of America, which, which she still has. Um, so whether she was scapegoated, you know, who knows? I, I've tried to find out, you know, what the internal politics of that were. I didn't get very far. Um, a couple of things that we do know. One is that she was in very close touch with a very senior official in the Justice Department by the name of Donna Busella, who's still very much part of the Homeland Security apparatus. Um, who was getting her to fax things directly to her. And when I told members of the FBI task force um, that that is what had occurred, they went bananas and said, you can't do that. It has to go through the task force in Oklahoma City. That Donna Bissella should have known that. This agent, if she didn't know that, then her bosses should have known that. This was a violation of protocol. It seems a little bit you know, inside baseball from the outside. There was also an issue with the financial records of everyone who was a subscriber to the same phone card that Terry Nichols had subscribed to, which McVeigh used that card as well. Um, the Spotlight Company, which um, publishes a, a, a far right wing magazine, also offered these phone cards. To, there were about 5,000 prescribers, subscribers. And um, Mary Riley asked for the financial records of all 5,000 people. And from my FBI sources, apparently this was a huge problem because it was a potential violation of a lot of people's privacy who had nothing to do with the bombing whatsoever. Um, but having said that, you know, what was not clear to me is whether Mary Riley made these mistakes herself, if she indeed made them, 
or if she was following directions, she was doing everything right, she was faxing everything. She, you know, we know from her fax headers that she was sending everything to the task force in Oklahoma City, as well as Donna Busella in Washington, or wherever Donna Busella was, because she went to Oklahoma City for a while too. Um, so it's unclear if she did anything wrong. Um, but the FBI used that as an excuse to shut the Secret Service out completely. They didn't trust the Secret Service. They didn't think they were a good investigative agency. And I have to say, from having seen their documents, with the exception of Mary Riley's work, I would tend to agree with that assessment. Um, and when they went to court, the only people who appeared in court were the FBI phone records analysts. And there was one witness who, who, um, worked, who was the head of the company that um, ran the phone service that the spotlight cards were used through. Um, he attempted to talk about a Secret Service agent in his testimony, and a uh, prosecution um, attorney jumped up as fast as he could, raised an objection, and changed the subject as fast as possible. And when you read the trial transcript, knowing this backstory, you know exactly why. But you know, when the jury was listening to it in court, they didn't know why this um, attorney was jumping up and objecting. It just looked like a piece of courtroom procedure. So it's, there was this fascinating piece of you know, background politics going on. And there's, this is just one instance of that through the trial. You know, once you've read all the documents and then you reread the trial transcript, you realize there's this whole intrigue going on. And, and, and it was reflected in who was called to the stand, how they were questioned, which questions they were not allowed to answer, and on and on. Why was the Secret Service involved anyway? They have general investigative interests in a number of things. They were tracking the radical far right for a number of reasons. Um, they, this is why I don't think they're very good, because I saw their documents where they're talking about you know, the radical far right in Oklahoma. And that document is riddled with mistakes. They were pulling second, third, fourth hand information from, from all over the place. One other way in which the Secret Service got involved is that um, I mentioned a little bit ago the neo-Nazi bank robbery gang who were called the Aryan Republican Army who robbed 22 banks. Um, before they became the bank robbery gang, one of their members by the name of Richard Guthrie had publicly threatened to kill President George W. Bush, H. W. Bush, excuse me. And his best friend from childhood, who ended up being the ringleader of the bank robbers, was, was somebody by the name of Pete Langan, who was in prison in Florida for holding up a pizza joint. The Secret Service went to him, offered to use him as an informant if he would go find Richard Guthrie for them. So he was sprung from prison. He was given a bus ticket to Cincinnati, where he was from. He and Guthrie met up, and they went underground. And that's when they started robbing banks together. So the Secret Service gave Pete Langan the gift of his life. Um, not, 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 not the world's most stellar law enforcement operation. The bank robberies were also influenced by the Turner Diaries? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and one of the biggest omissions um, in the whole investigation was when the bank robbers started to be arrested, which occurred in early 96 to mid 96, most of them were picked up. Um, there was no crossover between that investigation and the bombing investigation, and there absolutely should have been. When they raided a safe house in Columbus, Ohio, where they'd holed up, they found a gallon jugs of nitromethane, which was the uh, material that was used mixed with the ammonium nitrate to make the bomb in, for the Oklahoma City bombing. They found, um, they found blasting caps. They found various other explosive elements. They found... Um, they even found Christmas wrapping paper that was very similar to the Christmas wrapping paper that McVeigh had used to wrap up a bunch of blasting caps when he transported them at some point across the country. Um, now, not only were the investigators in Oklahoma City not told about this, but a lot of this evidence was actually destroyed. The blasting caps and the Christmas paper, for example, were destroyed, so there was no possibility after the fact to even look at them and see, is there a link here or isn't there? Um, when I spoke to one of the prosecutors who prosecuted the bank robbers, and you know, I, I, there's a lot of detail here of different individuals which I'll spare you, but there were a couple of people in particular in the rob bank robbery gang who were fingered by some of the others as potential bombers in Oklahoma City. And when I asked the, the prosecutor, well, why wasn't more effort made to see if indeed they were linked, you know, to investigate that, he made it clear, you know, that the reason they weren't was because they were being used as witnesses for the prosecution in the bank robbery prosecution, and that was the main focus of interest. And they didn't want to know whether they were involved in the Oklahoma City bombing, because if they did, it would just greatly complicate the prosecution. And it, it became e just as it became easier to prosecute McVeigh and Nichols and say, that's it, because that way you were more sure of convicting them, it became easier to prosecute the bank robbers, stick to them, and say, that's it, because otherwise that case might fall apart. 
Um, so there's a lot of politics of how to prosecute these cases, and you know, I feel very strongly that, and, and not only I, but a lot of the FBI agents involved in the Oklahoma City bombing who know this stuff now are furious that this wasn't properly processed and cross-checked so that they could have seen it if they could have found more conspirators in the bombing. Is there any possibility that any element of the case could be reopened? It's difficult to see how. Um, there have been various moments where that could have happened. One was in 1998, towards the end of Terry Nichols's trial, when the trial judge, Richard Mach, said from the bench, there are a number of questions that remain unanswered, and it would be very disappointing to me if the federal government stopped looking for those answers. Um, the investigation did formally stay open for a while longer. Another point where things could have been picked up was in 2005, when Terry Nichols gave information via one of his um, prison mates, who was Gregory Scarpa Jr., a mafia figure from New York, that there was more explosives buried under the house where he'd lived in Harrington, Kansas. And there was a whole soap opera about how the FBI got to find out about that. But when they did, they went digging, they found the explosives. Terry Nichols said, if you go looking, you will find fingerprints on those boxes that may lead you to other co-conspirators, which is the reason why he talked about it, because there was one of these people he wanted desperately to see prosecuted. The FBI took three years to analyze the fingerprints, and then when the results came back, they said, no usable fingerprints on here. Um, and that was the end of that. And as far as I know, that was the last time any investigative action was taken in the Oklahoma City bombing. How did you get involved in writing this book? I was first asked in 2001, just before McVeigh was executed, to write a feature for The Independent, my newspaper in London. And my first reaction, sight unseen, was, don't we know everything about that? Um, and I read a book which McVeigh had essentially dictated to two journalists from his hometown, Buffalo, New York, uh, which is sort of his version of events. And I read that, and knowing very little about the case, I thought, you know, I don't know much about the case, but I do know that whatever happened, it can't have been this, because it makes no <laughs> sense. What was, that, what, what was the particular thing that didn't make sense? Mostly that he took credit for having done everything. Right. Um, and it was as though, you know, he was this all-knowing, all-seeing person who drifted through this landscape of middle America for two or three years. He had no viable form of income. He had no particular bomb-making skill, but somehow he managed to put together this plot all by himself. And blah. It, it, just, it just made no sense. And then when I found out that the government's version of the case was essentially the same, that's when I started getting really intrigued. And you know, like everybody else, I did a lot of guessing. Um, and then, as I say, when these documents came out, I thought, OK, here's the opportunity, first of all, to find out what the government knew, and then another opportunity to go around and interview everybody, see if they'll talk and find out what the inside story was. And the great pleasure of this project was that almost everybody did talk. They were very frank, and a lot of people were really furious about what would happen and were thrilled to have the opportunity to make it public. And you know, in, in, you know, the, what they said was, you know, this is a fabulous project. We wish you all the best, which translated into English meant, we want you to get to the bottom of absolutely everything except the part that embarrasses me. <laughs> I think that's life in general, right? right. In, the, in the back here. Uh, yeah, John Mueller from uh, Ohio State and uh, from Cato Institute. Uh, you mentioned in, somewhat in passing that the bombing killed the movement. Would you expand a little bit more on that? And uh, there, if there were a bunch of other people, uh, we've not lived 17 years since that, essentially nothing has happened. They haven't done anything, as far, at least as far as I know. So maybe it had been best just to let it go rather than spend octillion dollars trying to trace these people down and maybe never convict them. Um, that's certainly an argument that I've heard. Um, from the people who are involved in the investigation. You know, the, the argument is essentially you never catch everyone. We caught the main people, you know, so be it. Life goes on and nothing bad has happened. I would contest that nothing bad has happened. I mean, certainly no federal buildings have been blown up. Um, but a number of people who I believe should have been questioned because they either demonstrated that they had foreknowledge of the bombing or because they had espoused the same cause of violent revolution absolutely went on and did more very unpleasant things. Uh, the bank robbers continued robbing banks, for example. Um, there was a character called Chevy Kehoe who on the morning of the bombing was bugging a motel owner in Spokane, Washington to turn on CNN. Um, and as soon as he turned on CNN, 10 minutes later, the first news of the bombing dropped and he looked like he knew all about it. And the motel keeper was absolutely spooked. And when he told the FBI this, the FBI showed no interest in it whatsoever. Chevy Kehoe went on to kill a family uh, a gun dealer and his, his wife and an eight-year-old daughter in Arkansas about a year later. You know, there were a number of very unpleasant things that happened, and I'm not saying that the investigation, had it been conducted differently, would have prevented those. Uh, 
but at the very least we would have had more answers and if any of these people were involved they would have been taken off the street. So I, I definitely take issue with the idea that nothing bad happened as a result of not taking the investigation wider. Um, what was the other part of your question? Excuse me. Um, no, you answered it. Right, right, okay. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Gordon Whitkin with the Center for Public Integrity. The book discusses uh, kind of a rogues gallery of the radical right. There's a lot of folks that you uh, provide some illumination about. Of that whole group of folks, who are the ones that you think were most likely involved directly in the conspiracy? I'll tell you right off, this is the question that the lawyer, HarperCollins, never wants me to answer. <laughs> but I'll answer it anyway. Um, but I have to couch it in very careful terms. You know, first of all, um, I say this in the book too, you know, that book authors are not, are not crime investigators. We don't have subpoena power. We don't have the power of arrest. You know, we can't bug people's phones. So there are limits to how much a book author can know. We can have suspicions. We can look at documents. We can see what the investigators knew. Uh, and base it on that. Um, you know, here's a list of people I would have absolutely questioned or found a way to question. Um, I think Lewis Beam would be very high on the list. Again, he was the propagandist for the movement. He'd been very active since the 1980s in declaring war on the government. He made an absolutely incendiary speech in 1992 in the wake of the Ruby Ridge incident in which he basically said, you know, the federal government's going to come and take your children in your homes and you have to take up arms and fight back against them if you don't want that to happen. Um, very bright, very dangerous man. Um, the FBI received information on him in early 96 that he knew that something was up uh, before the bombing. He talked about some kid they had who was going to do something, and he mentioned a number of cities in the Midwest that were going to be attacked. And forgive me for not remembering, but I think Oklahoma City was on the list of, of places that was mentioned. Um, again, I have no information that Lewis Beam was involved directly whatsoever. Um, but the fact that the federal government never even spoke to him about it is absolutely astonishing. There's a very seasoned ATF agent, who wonderful man named Jim Kavanagh, now retired, who described Lewis Beam as, as the as the Heydrich of, of the radical far right. You know, he was he was that kind of charismatic, extremely dangerous person. Um, so he would be high on my list of people to talk to. The bank robbers. Um, there's a lot of a lot of information to suggest that McVeigh knew them. Um, it's possible also that he was involved in some way in some of the bank robberies. It appears that McVeigh got a hold of banknotes from somewhere, very possibly through these bank robberies. He gave some of them to his sister to recycle. Um, he bought his sister a brand new um, SUV at a certain point. We don't know where the money for that came from because she was a student whose only viable form of income, as far as we know, was doing new jello wrestling in a, in a, in a bar. In, in upstate New York on the weekends, uh, which is something that the FBI found very amusing as well. <laughs> um, you know, lots of unanswered questions about what sources of income McVeigh was living off in that time between leaving the army and, and the bombing. Um, so, you know, they were uh, absolutely, you know, and then the people at Elohim City. Um, the FBI did go to Elohim City, they did ask some questions, but by the time they got there, which was mid-96, so a year after the bombing, most of the radical criminals who had been there were flushed out. The leader of the community, Robert Millar, a very clever man, he made sure that he was in touch with federal law enforcement constantly. He made himself available. He said, if you want anything, I'll give you whatever you want. The FBI in particular and the ATF never really asked him for much. And interestingly, after the bombing, it was Millar who came to Oklahoma City to the task force to talk to them, not the other way around, because he was trying to make sure that the rumors he was hearing of the FBI or the ATF raiding his community were not true, or if they were true, that he could ward it off. Um, but they showed relatively little interest. There were a lot of people there, um, including some of the leftovers from the 1983 plot to blow up the Murrah building, who were at Elohim City. They were never questioned. Just sort of clarification, yeah. I mean, McVeigh was living at Elohim City for some period of time? He was, no, this is, this is a great unanswered question. Um, according to the official version, as presented you know, by the Justice Department, what the prosecutors said when they were asked you know, on the record at the time, they said McVeigh was never at Elohim City. We have no evidence mm -hmm. that he was ever there. So the idea that you would try and link Elohim City into the plot is a conspiracy theory. What I found out 15, 16, 17 years later is in fact the FBI had written in a document to the Justice Department that they had solid information that he'd been there. Every investigator, senior investigator I talked to, including Bob Ricks, who was the head of the FBI in Oklahoma at the time, talked to Robert Millar on a regular basis. 
He said he had information that McVeigh had either been there or had passed through on a regular basis. Um, when I spoke to one of the federal prosecutors and said, you know, why wasn't more done to look at Elohim City? His response 15 years later, maybe having forgotten how vehemently this was denied in the past, he said, so McVeigh was there, so what? Which I found a very revealing little slip. Um, you know, there's a tremendous amount of circumstantial evidence that he was there, that he had friends there. There was a shady German who lived at Elohim City by the name of Andreas Strassmeier, who I ended up interviewing for, for four days straight in Germany a couple of years ago. He knew McVeigh for sure because they'd met at a gun show. He gave McVeigh his business card. McVeigh called Elohim City two weeks before the bombing. And according to an FBI document, it may have been that he was calling to try and recruit somebody else because he wasn't sure if he could count on Terry Nichols. Um, Strassmeyer, I don't believe, was involved in the bombing, having spoken to him at length. And I don't think he would have spoken to me at all if he was. But I do think he knows an awful lot. And he told me some of it. Um, but I think there are other things he knows that, especially the extent of his friendship with McVeigh, that he wasn't willing to let on. Just to give you a little hint of how close Strassmeyer may have been to McVeigh. Um, fast forward six or seven months, Strassmeyer was getting very nervous about federal law enforcement interest in him because they did become interested in him. And he ended up leaving the country in very melodramatic fashion, which is described in the book. Um, one of the things that tipped off his friends in the far right that there may be a problem was um, he bragged one day about having McVeigh's field jacket from the Gulf War. And his friend Dave Holloway said, oh, come on, Andy, that's just nonsense. You know, you're just bragging as usual. And he said, no, 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 I really have it. And he goes to a duffel bag and pulls out this jacket. And Dave Holloway looks and sees that there's the big red, big red one insignia for the 1st Infantry Division. And then he sees the, 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 the tag on it saying McVeigh. And he goes, holy crap, <laughs> you know, this is not good. Um, but again, Strassmeyer was interviewed once, very perfunctorily, over the phone once he was back in Germany by two of the federal prosecutors and one FBI agent. They just lobbed softball questions at him, and it was clear the whole point of the interview was just to be able to say, we've talked to you. It's that particular um, you know, un unfinished piece of business is now finished. We can move on. And um, Danny Deffenbaugh, who was the head of the FBI investigation into the bombing, who was personally very interested in Strassmeyer was endlessly frustrated that that's the way things went. Thanks, Ken Dante. Um, one of the things about McVeigh was that he was part of this Christian identity movement. And of course, it's very much of an apocalyptic movement. In some ways, just generally to cause kind of a non-ending apocalypse, it's kind of a warrior image. Uh, would you like to comment, if you know anything, about the WMD idea? Like, in, in a way, he kind of created an asymmetric poor man's WMD, which he drove to that, uh, the complex in Oklahoma City. And I'm wondering, and I think I, I believe I read something that he had written about Saddam Hussein and the WMDs there, kind of justifying that, even justifying his own actions. Okay, let me, there are a few different pieces here to unpick, so let me, let me talk about a couple of them. Um, the Christian identity movement is fascinating. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's essentially you know, a deeply racist form of religious belief that says that you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are essentially the true, Christian, uh, the, the true children of Israel, um, that Jews are uh, the spawn of Satan, and they have a whole theology going back to Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden that justifies that, and that African Americans are essentially you know, subhuman. Um, and it's a very dangerous, it, there are different theological strands. Of course, it's not possible to have a fringe um, belief like this without it breaking up into all kinds of rival factions. Um, but it's a very dangerous ideology for a number of reasons. And one of, one of the offshoots of it is something that's known as the Phineas priesthood, which again goes back to a story in the Bible of um, a priest who used his javelin to kill um, an Israelite who was having an affair with a Midianite woman, I believe. Anyway, the, the theory is that Phineas was a hero for killing an interracial couple. And that the Phineas priesthood is an elite vanguard of radical right-wing anti-government warriors whose job it is to go around killing people and waging revolution in the name of religious as well as political righteousness. Um, McVeigh, having said that, was not part of that. Um, he knew those people. And I think he sympathized with them. But there's no evidence that McVeigh had any kind of religious bent that pushed him in the directions that he went. 
Um, what I think is a more interesting area of looking at the wellsprings of his revolutionary ideas is his service in the Gulf War and his experience of fighting the Iraqis. And he, was, he went into the Gulf War as the perfect soldier. He, his superiors couldn't believe how extraordinary he was. He was always perfectly turned out. He knew his weaponry. He w excelled at every task that was given to him. When the soldiers went kind of crazy on the weekends and got drunk, he would make sure that he stayed sober and he would use his car to drive them around, get them home safely, charge money for it. Um, everybody loved him. He goes to the Gulf. He's a gunner. He, his job is to man a Bradley fighting vehicle. He wins medals. Um, it performs extraordinary feats one, on one particular occasion when he managed to kill an Iraqi at a distance of about a mile. Uh, one shot took him out. Um, but as the fighting went on, and in particular towards the, in, in the four days of the ground war, when literally the Americans were moving forward and just grinding up Iraqi soldiers into the sand with huge machines, burying them alive, um, something happened to McVeigh. And I'm not a psychologist, and I wouldn't pretend to be able to describe in exact terms what that was. But I can say that beforehand, he was gung-ho. He was killing with great alacrity. Some of his fellow soldiers reported that he actually killed soldiers who'd already surrendered, therefore you know, was potentially a war criminal. He did all that with great gusto, and then suddenly something hit him, and he decided, these people are poor conscripts. They shouldn't be our enemy. The United States has no business doing anything other than defending its own borders. This is some great corruption. We've been hoodwinked into performing a United Nations operation when it's the last thing we should be doing. And McVeigh ended up identifying with the Iraqis. He became disillusioned. He left the army. Um, and he's sort of cracked in a certain way. And one fascinating piece of information is that at a certain point, about a year after he left the army, he called the Veterans Administration Hospital in Florida. Uh, he'd been feeling suicidal and was looking for psychological help. Um, and they were willing to give it to him. And then he said, can I come in without giving my name and you know, identifying myself? And they said, no, 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 we need to know who you are. And then he dropped the idea and never went in. And it's tantalizing to think that if he'd sought help, then things might have turned out rather differently. But um, you know, that was certain. I don't know anything to do with Saddam Hussein and, and, and weapons of mass destruction. I'm not aware of any link that he made to that. OK, question here, front. Yeah. The book talks about how, at a fairly key point in the investigation, as a result of the fallout from Ruby Ridge, that two of the FBI senior folks, Danny Colson and Larry Potts, were essentially sidelined. Can you talk a little bit about what you think the impact of that was on the direction of the investigation and also give us your assessment of the conduct of the FBI director, Louis Free, in this investigation? It's a great question. Um, one of the things that is absolutely hair-raising when you get into the detail of this investigation is that there was a political battle royal going on within the FBI at the time and it had a terribly damaging effect on the investigation. Essentially, in the wake of Ruby Ridge and Waco, there was a tremendous amount of pressure from Congress to find culprits for the screw-ups and for the FBI to make itself accountable, the ATF also. Um, Louis Free, at the same time, he took over after Waco in 1993. He had this idea. He had only been in the FBI for six years, and I think you know, partly for reasons that one can justify, that he thought that the FBI was top-heavy, too managerial, which, for which there's a very good argument to be made. And partly, I think, for, for personal reasons, he didn't like the top brass of the FBI. He felt like he was an outsider. He felt like they didn't like him. He was going to go after them. And by the time he was done as director, he had replaced every single special agent in charge. So the heads of the field divisions of the FBI, he would replaced every single one. And he started that process right at the beginning, and he had it in for those people. Um, Larry Potts, who you mentioned, he wanted him to be his deputy director. He was somebody who had gone through the ranks very fast. He never was a special agent in charge. Um, he was an exception. But Danny Colson, who was the special agent in charge in Dallas when the bomb went off, he was on the director's shit list. Uh, Joe Martin Ulrich, who was up in Detroit, who played an instrumental role in going after James Nichols, fought furiously with the director because he didn't believe there was enough evidence to arrest James Nichols for anything related to the bombing. Uh, Free said, I don't care, arrest him anyway, we'll find the evidence afterwards. Martin Ulrich ended up leaving the bureau early. He was sidelined, es essentially. But to come back to what you're talking about, um, there was a tremendous amount of pressure to find people who were accountable for the mistakes at Ruby Ridge in particular. And what happened at Ruby Ridge from the FBI point of view, just to say it very briefly, is that there was a rewrite of the rules of engagement. 
that effectively opened the door for an FBI sniper to kill Vicki Weaver, who was uh, the wife of the person who the federal government was trying to arrest, while she was holding her 14-year-old baby in her arms. And this was an appalling act by any, by any standard. And Randy Weaver, who was the one they were after, when they ended up trying to prosecute him in court after this debacle, he ended up walking free. His lawyer, Jerry Spence, managed to humiliate the government in court because they had really behaved in an appalling way. And nothing, nothing represented that more than this sniper shooting of, of Vicki Weaver. And in fact, on radical right-wing circles, the name of the sniper was, circ was circulated at, at gun shows. And you know, people were encouraged to go find him and kill him which never happened. Um, but anyway, it was very important for certain members of Congress, for members of the public, for people who cared deeply about this, to find out who had been responsible for changing the rules of engagement. And the FBI launched its own internal investigation. The Justice Department launched an investigation. Um, it's incredibly murky to sort of figure out exactly what happened. But Larry Potts certainly was involved in the discussions of changing the rules of engagement. Danny Colson was peripherally involved in those discussions as well. And in the summer of 1995, when the Oklahoma City bombing investigation was you know, very hot, um, they ended up being put on administrative leave along with three others. They were never told why they were being put on administrative leave. They stayed there for two years. They weren't even given the means to defend themselves because they didn't know what they were being accused of. And Potts and Colson, in the end, were just allowed to retire. There was no disciplinary action taken against them, but they were effectively taken out of the picture. Um, they had actually been taken off the Oklahoma City investigation even sooner than that. Colson was involved in the first few days. He's a very... Um, He's a very interesting character. He had tremendous amount of experience in, in, in going up against the radical far right. He had been responsible for a siege in 1985 against a group called the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord, which ended peacefully, unlike Waco. Um, so he was a logical person to turn to in this, in this investigation. He certainly felt like he should have been asked to run it, instead of which he was told his services were no, no longer required after the first week or so. He was very shocked by that. Larry Potts, meanwhile, was promoted to deputy director um, just a couple of weeks after the bombing, Louis Free thought that the bombing would give him enough cover to make the appointment stick. Uh, Jamie Gorelick, the deputy attorney general, was furiously opposed, but she eventually relented. Um, but after the appointment was made, there was a public outcry. Everybody said, how can you appoint this guy as deputy, uh, as deputy of the FBI when, he's got, you know, taint, when his name is tainted from Ruby Ridge? Uh, Larry Potts basically fought for his name for six weeks instead of overseeing the Oklahoma City investigation. And then when he was put on administrative leave, that was the end of his career. Um, who did they appoint to, to run the investigation? The logical person would have been Bob Ricks, who was the special agent in charge in Oklahoma. Ricks had a couple of strikes against him. One was that he had been very chummy with uh, Robert Millar, the head of Elohim City. Um, and there were questions as to whether he'd handled that right. I don't know if that's the reason why Free overlooked him. I think the reason Free overlooked him was because um, they'd both been rivals for the job of director of the FBI in 1993. Um, and Free didn't want to give any ammunition to, to Ricks to challenge him in any way, which is the way he seemed to behave with a lot of the special agents in charge. So Ricks is shunted aside. For the first month, they have, or less than a month, they have Weldon Kennedy, who's somebody on the way out of the bureau, regarded as a safe pair of hands. He comes in from Arizona, he, he minds the shop. Then he's out of there because he doesn't want to be involved anymore. He ends up becoming deputy director in, in, in Potts' place. And they appoint a man called Danny Deffenbaugh who had never been in charge of anything much. He was a bomb specialist. He'd been the number two in Mobile, Alabama. Um, but he was not regarded as somebody who had any managerial skill. And I spoke to Danny Deffenbaugh a tremendous amount for this book. He was a terrific source. I'm extremely grateful to him, but he's the first person who will tell you, you shouldn't put me in charge of anything. I don't have the right temperament. You know, he's, he's got a short fuse, he's irascible, he doesn't get along with people, and he didn't have the sufficient political clout to do the things that the head of the investigation should have been able to do. So, for example, when he wanted to interview Str Andreas Strassmeyer and he was overruled, that's a typical example of the limits of Danny Deffenbaugh's power. He wanted to go after somebody by the name of Roger Moore, who was um, a retired boat builder, very rich, uh, lived part of the year in a ranch in Arkansas with his girlfriend, part of the year in Florida with his wife. He had an open relationship with both of them. He went on the gun show circuit. His, his uh, girlfriend ran an ammunition business. There were, there were a lot of reasons to think that McVeigh's relationship with Roger Moore was very fishy. 
Uh, Danny Deffenbaugh was one of them. But the prosecutors decided they wanted Roger Moore as a prosecution witness because they believed that McVeigh had been responsible for a robbery at Roger Moore's ranch, and their theory was that this is what had financed the bombing. Deffenbaugh was overruled on that yet again. In the run-up to the trial, the prosecutors went to a field agent, not to Deffenbaugh, but to a field agent to go through the witness testimony. They went around Deffenbaugh. Deffenbaugh was furious. There was nothing he could do. He was basically burned from all sides. Um, he was thought of as somebody who wasn't the right person for the job, and it's really extraordinary that Louis Free appointed him. And one has to speculate that the reason was that Free wanted somebody relatively weak in Oklahoma City so that the real leadership of the investigation could be conducted elsewhere um, along the lines that I've been describing all along. I hope that answers your question. Gentleman in front here. Um, What's your name, sir? Gary Forber with the Epoch Times. Um, am I to understand then that 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 um, uh, uh, McVeigh, uh, when he checked out the Oklahoma City, he he knew that the bomb was then going to uh, was really d uh, targeting the uh, the daycare center. Now I thought it was something that he didn't want it to happen, but it was just a collateral damage. But it, you're saying it was a deliberate intention to make that the target. He certainly said after the bombing, you know, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to kill the kids. Um, I don't believe him for an instant. No, I think it was absolutely deliberate. He wanted to take revenge for the children who died at Waco. Um, there's another little wrinkle to that story, which is something that no one's ever got to the bottom of, and various people have tried. The local law enforcement tried. The federal for prosecutors tried to look at it as well. In 1993, Terry Nichols's two-year-old son, Jason, asphyxiated to death on a plastic bag at the Nichols farm. Um, and it was deemed to be an accident, but no one completely believed that it was. First of all, Mara Faye Nichols, the boy's mother, didn't believe it. She first um, wondered if her husband had had something to do with it. She was terrified that he had. She suspected McVeigh. She suspected all kinds of people. The local coroner didn't believe entirely that it was an accident, but he couldn't prove otherwise. The local police had their suspicions. As I say, federal law enforcement had their suspicions. One possibility, and we don't know any more than that, is that McVeigh killed Jason Nichols, first of all, as some kind of really twisted way to terrify the life out of Terry and force him to drag, you know, scare him into doing what he wanted from there on out. That, that's one possible motivation. And the other is as a kind of trial run to see if he could kill children and, and, and be OK with it. I don't know if that's true or not. But the part I'm absolutely convinced of is that he knew about the daycare center and that he blew it up deliberately. We know that because he visited in December of 1994. And we know that also because you know, I never did this because I never went to Oklahoma City before the bombing. But when you were on Fifth Street where he left the truck and looked up, you could see the artwork of the children on the plate glass windows of the, day, uh, of the Mara building directly above you. Um, and, you know, anybody who had even, you know, if, if you were driving up and you looked at the building, you would have seen that there was children's activity going on on the second floor directly above the place where they left the truck. Any other questions? Still here. Uh, Chris Hopkins, National Journal. Uh, what lessons, if any, can we take from this story? It, to, put it, to put it another way, uh, why should we revisit this now? OK, that's a great question. I mean, I think you know, there are two stages of answering that question. The first is, I think, if the lessons of Oklahoma City had been articulated at the time, there would have been an opportunity to learn from them. Maybe things would have gone differently in the run-up to 9-11. That's point number one. Point number two, where are we now? I think it's instructive to look at the two incidents together, actually. You know, how the federal government responded to the threat um, in 94, 95, how they responded to the different threat from al-Qaeda in the run-up to 9-11 and whether the federal authorities are any better now at anticipating threats from places they aren't looking than they were then. You know, I think that's a very pressing question. I think another pressing question is to ask how do the federal law enforcement agencies work together? You know, how can we avoid the Secret Service, the FBI, the ATF from all being at each other's throats, withholding information, um, and being compartmentalized in that way in the first place. And I think that question is very far from being answered. You know, when on, on joint terrorism task forces, sort of a, a fairly big answer to that. 
In theory. Yeah. Um, but you look at what happened recently with the Fast and Furious scandal with the ATF, you know, when they were walking guns across the border into Mexico in an attempt to track uh, cross-border crime, and, and it all blew up in their faces. Every FBI agent I've spoken to said, you know, this is unconscionable. How can they do this? They're a bunch of yahoos. They don't know what they're doing. Why does the ATF even exist? You know, here we are in 2000. This was 2011 when I had those conversations, but 2012 now. You know, those kind of, you know, the ATF is now part of the Justice Department, as is the FBI. Previously, it was part of Treasury. That hasn't helped. Joint Terrorism Task Forces, I'm sure they work in some circumstances. My experience of talking to ATF and FBI agents is that every now and again, you come across stories of how they work together beautifully. So they certainly can. Um, but um, you know, one of the most memorable lines that I was given was um, an, H uh, an FBI agent who was based in Oklahoma who was describing you know, the way in which the ATF made the first screw up at Ruby Ridge, which they did. They were the ones who were after Randy Weaver, and it escalated from there. They were the ones who made the first screw up at Waco, which is also true. Um, they were going to go in to try and investigate illegal weapons there. They found out that they knew the, the people in the, in the compound knew that they were coming, but they went ahead anyway. There was a shootout. A whole bunch of people died at the beginning of the siege. And in both cases, the FBI then came in afterwards and, you know, in my view, made their own mistakes. But the line that I love is um, Tim Arney, this, this agent in, in Muskogee, said, you know, here we were looking at, at, at Elohim City, the fact that the ATF were talking about possibly raiding the place, which they were. And he went, oh, my God, we don't want to take another bite out of that shit sandwich. And that's the way the two agencies institutionally regard each other. And I think to this day, you know, um, another thing about Elohim City was that they did have meetings, joint terrorism task force meetings, effectively, informal ones where the FBI and the ATF would get together every now and again to talk about what they knew about what was going on at Elohim City, because it had been a target for law enforcement for years before the bombing. They would meet in a hotel room. They'd sit there, look at each other, and they wouldn't say a word. You know, they would chit chat. They would say things that meant nothing. They weren't ever going to spit what they knew to the other. Neither of them knew very much to start with, for the most part, and they wouldn't communicate to the other what they knew, even though that was the purpose of the meeting. And I heard that from ATF people who attended the meetings and from FBI people who attended the meetings. It's like, yeah, we, it was kind of a joke. We'd get together, we'd theoretically be pooling our knowledge, but actually that's the last thing we'd be doing. And you know, I think that problem hasn't gone away. Yeah, we at the New America Foundation look at um, all the terrorism cases since 9-11. We've, I think there are 190 plus, Jennifer Rowland here, uh, maintains the database of jihadi terrorism cases. And it's interesting to me um, that in none of the jihadi terrorism cases have anybody tried to do a biological, radiological, nuclear, or chemical attack. But if you can compare with the right wing since 9-11, uh, there have been four cases of fairly serious attempts to build a radiological weapon by people coming out of the right-wing movement. So in terms of, you know, we're always sort of looking at this, the Maginot line problem. It's sort of always looking at the wrong thing in a sense. If there is a radiological bomb attack in this country, it is far more likely to come out of the right wing, which you've already said is sort of slightly re-energized, when I say the right-wing militia movement, uh, than it is to come out of sort of an al-Qaeda-related uh, uh, organization based on the, just the evidence we have. So, I mean, the, I think there are, I mean, one, I guess one sort of way to kind of close this, uh, Andrew, is to, obviously Oklahoma City was the, you know, it was as, it, it, it helped Clinton in a sense um, destroy Newt Gingrich. Um, and it certainly destroyed um, the, uh, the militia movement. Um, what do you think the future of uh, right-wing terrorism is in this country? And uh, given the fact, in particular, since 9-11, there has been a massive, you know, whether it's DHS or TSA or 100 Joint Terrorism Task Forces, and there's a huge amount of effort. And, and by the way, a lot of this effort is directed at the right wing. Going, going back to our database, it, it's just as likely for the government to put an informant into a right-wing case as it is in a jihadi case. It's just as likely uh, for there to be serious law enforcement effort based on the data that exists. So what is the future of this? Are they sort of, do they have any future, I guess, is a question. Wow. Um, I don't know if I'm qualified to answer the question. Um, I think, you know, one thing you can do is just, you know, one thing I, I, I cannot, the one way I can answer it is to look back historically at, you know, where the wellsprings of this kind of violence have come from. And it has been, a constant presence in, you know, it's been a feature 
of this country going back quite a long way. Um, in the 1980s, just to go back that far, there were tremendously effective groups. There was a group called The Order that, that um, killed Alan Berg, the radio host in Denver. They knocked over an armored truck in Northern California and got away with more than $3 million. Um, there was the Covenant, the Sword, the Arm of the Lord. They plotted a lot of things. They did, in practice, rather fewer. But they, they had very serious plots to kill federal judges, kill FBI agents. Uh, they were thinking about um, putting cyanide in city water supplies, this kind of thing. In the 90s, you had um, the Oklahoma City bombing, something that happened very recently, which, you know, tying the politics into it, which I think is very interesting. Um, you know, one of the features of the 90s until the Oklahoma City bombing is that it became rather trendy, especially within the context of the New Greenwich Revolution, to attack the ATF, to attack the FBI, to talk about jackbooted thugs in, in, in bucket helmets. Um, I think G. Gordon Liddy on his radio show encouraged his listeners to shoot ATF agents and make sure there's only headshots. You know, this kind of really irresponsible talk. Um, there's been a whiff of that kind of thing recently. I don't know if anybody remembers in 2010, uh, someone flew a light plane into the IRS building in Austin, mm -hmm. Texas. Um, and there was a Republican congressman from Iowa. Um, it's Steve King, I think. I always get him a lot with Pete King. But it's Steve King who said, you know, I sympathize with why he did it. I think there is a wellspring of sympathy at the, you know, within the political mainstream, maybe on the edge of the political mainstream, but nevertheless with it, within it, for the idea of someone who's so mad at the federal government that they're going to take up a weapon or use a plane as a weapon and, 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 and take retaliatory action that's going to result in loss of life, damage to property, and so on and so forth. And that, to me, is an alarming thing. And if you look at the radicalization of the Republican Party, and again, I wouldn't tar the whole party with this, but I think there has been, as there was in the early to mid-90s, a, sort of a sense that somehow this is a legitimate part of American discourse, the idea that you can take arms and start shooting people in the name of patriotism. Um, and it's been part of the country from the beginning. You know, I think that one of the ways that American heroism is defined has always been in one of two ways. There's a terrific book um, by Billy Gibson called, it's in here at the very beginning, I'll look it up, <laughs> Warrior Dreams, it's called. You know, he talks mm. about the two sort of archetypical American heroes are, you know, the good soldier and the outlaw. And McVeigh, in many ways, typified both of those things. Um, and I think the outlaw still has a romance in this society, which is potentially very dangerous, especially when you have weapons of mass destruction that are potentially within the reach of ordinary people. Well, thank you, Andrew. That was a really very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and let's give Andrew a <laughs>